Welcome to Arm Solutions. Today we're talking about the Beretta M9A1 pistol. Now the Beretta M9A1 pistol is, uh, is very significant in the history of the M9 uh, pistol. Uh, because first off, it was requested, it had changes by the Marine Corps around 2003-2004, and it was adopted in 2005. But uh, what's unique about this pistol, if you were to look at the history of the M M16 M4, uh, if you look at the issues that the M4 had in the early global war on terrorism, that uh, the special forces wanted, or SOCOM wanted Colt to correct, but Colt wouldn't because they, they, they said their rifle was a TDP rifle or had it manufactured to the technical data package and they weren't willing to make any kind of changes to support a SOCOM. Well, Beretta was not the same. Uh, when uh, Beretta was approached by Marine Corps, they had said, we had some improvements to this pistol. And Beretta happily did it. Uh, they provided a, a pistol for the Marine Corps with their updates that was a COTS pistol or a commercial off-the-shelf pistol. It was not a TDP pistol, um, so it had many changes. And this, they were a direct sale to the Marine Corps. So it shows how some companies can be cooperative with other customers and some not so much. But Brenner worked very closely with the Marine Corps to give them exactly what they wanted. Well, let's talk a little bit about the M9 pistol to begin with. Uh, I do have a video out there. It's called the uh, M9 Fact versus Fiction where it gives you the full story of the M9 pistol. I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that. I do, I do touch on the M9A1 on there as well. But uh, we, do, we happen to have an M9A1 right now, and I'm going to go over it. But uh, first, we're going to talk about the M9 Beretta. Uh, the M9 Beretta went into service in 1985. Um, it was an extremely controversial pistol due to the fact that uh, it was 9mm. Um, the people were used to the M1911. You know, the M1911s they had have uh, been in service for... Well, hell, they, they can go back to 1911. The last uh, group of pistols that was bought by the military from Colt was probably in the late 50s. So there was no new pistols or anything procured since the 50s. So you had a lot of guns that were really, really uh, old and tired. And the 45 Auto certainly was had an excellent reputation as a man stopper. You know, a big, heavy, 230 grain bullet, you know, around 900 foot a second, 850 foot a second. Um, it was a very popular caliber with the people who used them. However, the M1911 was not the nicest or easiest gun to shoot if you weren't somebody who was very familiar with firearms. You had a lot of recoil. You had it was a lot of heft. You only had seven rounds, uh, single action only, and you also had the issue with uh, you know with, with the firing if it was dropped because you had a uh, free floating firing pin in there. And if you wanted to carry it, you had to carry it cocked and locked. Um, so it, it had its fair share of issues. But the real drive for the 9mm came due to NATO standardization for all NATO allies wanting to use the same ammunition. For instance, everybody uses 9mm, everybody uses 5.56, everybody uses 762 by 51 So the U.S. was the only, one of the only countries that was not in compliance with that, going with the 45 Auto. So they had to choose a millimeter pistol, and it was a very grueling test. And part of that test was uh, for durability and reliability, and unfortunately, there was no American-made handguns to even completed that. Uh, so once we they got done with the Colt, the Smith and Wesson, and so forth, the only two pistols left standing were the Zivi 92 SB and the B226 Sig, and those two pistols uh, were neck and neck in every test for rod reliability, durability, and in fact they were the same price for the pistols, but one of them has to be chosen. So where the M9 Beretta, where Beretta won the contract, was their cost was slightly less on. The cost of spare parts and magazines slightly, and that was enough to push you know Beretta over Sig. And again, it had nothing to do with which pistol was better. They both met and exceeded all their, their specifications. So the Beretta was adopted, and several American companies decided that they wanted to protest it, saying it wasn't fair. They were hand selected pistols. They wanted a retest. They got it. And the pistols that were selected for the retest were Beretta pistols that were bought as part of the contract, not hand-selected ones or whatnot. But oddly enough, all the American-made companies who brought up this lawsuit and wanted the retest didn't even show up to compete in the retest. So the M9 went through its test again, the Beretta, and it would won again. The pistol had gone on uh, to become deployed. There were some issues with the uh, Navy SEAL unit who had had some slides fracture. And that was an issue that came out that... Uh, there's very little factual information that was put out on that. A lot of people think that it was Uzi submachine gun ammunition. No, it was not. Uh, the ammunition that was used was some of the first lots of uh, M882 ball ammunition, which Winchester had loaded. And they had loaded up the load for standard 9mm in a 9mm NATO cartridge case. And if you're not familiar with the difference between 9mm NATO ammunition and 9mm commercial ammunition, is the brass is thicker on the, on the 9mm NATO. The shot cups sits up higher uh, on a 9mm NATO cartridge case than it does on a 9mm 
commercial. And when that moves up, the gap between the projectile and the, the propellant is smaller, which creates higher pressure. So basically what was happening was the ammunition that was loaded was loaded to nearly plus P plus you know, proof loads. And that's what was causing the pistols to break. Oddly enough, the, the fractured slides has never been seen by Beretta in any other country, any other law enforcement, anywhere. This was a problem that was uniquely seen by the United States military. And after all was said and done, uh, they found out that it was the ammunition that was the culprit. Because all that ammunition was still out there, the military had to come up with a solution, or Beretta had to come up with a solution to prevent the slides from ever coming off the back of the uh, firearm hitting, hitting a person. So Beretta developed what they called the slide capture device, which was which was they enlarged the hammer pin on the left hand side of the pistol, and they cut a notch into the back bottom of the slide on the uh, on the M9. So if the pistol was to have a, a slide failure, the slide capture device would catch the back of the sl back of the slide, so it wouldn't exit off the rear of the frame. Now, because that problem was caused by the military and, and, and bad ammunition, Beretta was not responsible for that. So the U.S. government had to pay for the designing, the development and uh, the retrofitting of all the guns with this, modif this modification to prevent that, those kind of failures. And there were some other issues that came up with that as well. Uh, first off was defamation. Uh, the military had gone and publicly and, and slammed the right as being a, a, poor, you know, a poor quality pistol, and it, was, uh, it, was, it wasn't reliable, and it was going to come back and hit you in the face. So the government had to pay quite a bit of money for restitution for defamation on Beretta. So we go forward. The uh, the pistol has done very well. Uh, those problems are very rarely seen. Most of the time when you see pistols that have any kind of conditions like that are pistols that have been put into a training environment where they're shot day after day after day. No round counts are not maintained. They don't replace recoil springs. You know, guns do wear out. Parts do wear out over the over time. And uh, our military has a big problem with maintaining weapons uh, for as far as knowing, you know, they don't know round counts. They don't know how many rounds have been through them. They just keep firing them until something goes wrong. So eventually weapons will fail. We're going to move forward to uh, the global war on terror. Uh, the Marine Corps was issued the pistol as well as, you know, across the, across the board. The Army, uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, only ones who were using anything other than that was uh, SOCOM, which is mostly P226s. And you did find some elements in SOCOM, which did use the M9 as well. But um, the Marine Corps had decided that they wanted some modifications to the pistol. You know, the basic M9 pistol, they felt that the, hang, the, the trigger guard was too weak. Uh, they like to use a trigger guard for, what we, let's just say, compliance. Uh, if they were to strike somebody with it, uh, the trigger guard would bend. And also, they had no ability to mount any kind of a flashlight onto it at all. They also weren't very fond of the way the, uh, the grips were on here as well, the checkering. So they went to Beretta and said, we want some modifications that were done. So Beretta came back with what's known as the M9A1. So taking a look at the M9A1, the main differences is first and foremost was the addition of the 1913 rail in the front. This enabled them to attach uh, flashlights to the, to the pistol. Also, if you notice the trigger guard, you'll notice how the trigger guard on the M9A1 is significantly thicker. That was one of the requirements that they had had. Next, we're going to look at the, the texture on the back strap and the, back strap and the front strap. You'll notice significantly more checkering on the M9A1, as you see here on my, on my left, versus the M9 on the back strap, as well as the front strap. Uh, they wanted that. Another issue was the sights. If you look at the sights on the M9, which is on my right, you'll see there's a two-dot system. The Marine Corps opted for a three-dot system, as you see on the M9A1 on my left. So those were the main features, but there were some other benefits that went along with this. Another difference that was made was an improvement to the magazine. Shown here on my right is the standard M9 magazine which you see is a black type finish. Now the M9A1 came with what was called a PVD finish, or this particular finish was designed to work better in the desert environment. The sand was less apt to stick and less apt to cause malfunctions. It was designed specifically for use with the desert environment that our troops were dealing with. Now this has been used in, in many you know, M9 pistols. Uh, however, this is still a commercial off the shelf, which meant it was only sold to the Marine Corps. It was never sold to the Army. Now, so there were some other uh, big benefits that went along with the M9A1. Now, you hear me refer to the M9 as a TDP gun or technical data package gun, which means the way that was procured, it's procured by the Army has to come off of a specific type of drawings, which has specific specifications for every single component for it to work properly. In the case of the Beretta, there's been a lot of updates that have happened over the last 25, 30 years. Uh, and one of the most important ones was the locking block itself. Uh, Breda has gone through up to four different revisions of the locking block, each one significantly increasing its durability and reliability. For instance, the original M9 has the original locking block, which 
had probably a life of probably between ten to fifteen thousand rounds and before you'd have to replace it or it would break. Then you'll go to the next the next one, which would probably go up to say uh sixteen to eighteen thousand. And now the ones they have now, the Gen 3 and 4s, will probably get you well over twenty five to 30,000 rounds uh, of strength of the locking block. Well, due to the fact that it wasn't on the TDP, the Army never approved those improved components. So, basically, the M9 is being procured with 1985 production parts, even though there's better parts that were out there. Well, when it came to the M9A1, because it wasn't built off the TDP, it was a special gun for the Marine Corps, it didn't have to adhere to that. The new M9 was able to take all the advantages of the updated locking blocks, locking block pins, and so forth. Uh, so, which means the M9A1 has the latest locking block, which is a requirement of two different components. You have the locking block itself and the locking block pin. Part of the major enhancement of the locking block on the newer pistols is the plunger pin is much smaller in diameter, which leaves a lot more metal there uh, for strength. So you have two new components that would be in the inventory if it was to go into the U.S. government, which the Army didn't want to do. Well, the M9A1 could very well do that. So it has the improved locking block. they also gone with some other uh, components. They, they, they lightened it up with a polymer spring guide. Now, of course, people would say going to polymer on, on the spring guide, well, that's just being cheap. Actually, no, it's not. There's no, there's no pressure or no strain on that component. It doesn't break. So going to a, a polymer spring guide makes absolutely no difference in the world other than making it a little bit lighter. Now, the M9A1 pistol uh, has proven itself very well. Now, on the higher level, the M9A1 uses the exact same components. It is completely backwards compatible with the M9 pistol. All the trigger mechanism, magazines, everything, every component on there is the same. The major changes is going to be just on the frame itself, which you know, there's no relevance for as far as uh, of, of components. Uh, the, the frame has change, a change in the 1913 rail, has the changes with this track airing, but all the internal components are the exact same. So, for as far as making an improved pistol at a higher at a higher quality, higher reliability, the only two components on this pistol that are not backwards compatible with the U.S. military M9 is strictly the locking block and the locking block pin. So, you have a major improvement. Now, the M9A1, the M9A1 did make a lot of use of the uh, 1913 rail, and also the serial number on the M9. The serial number on the M9 pistol is is all numerics. Now, because this is a commercial off the shelf, you will have the BER uh, in front of the serial number, and it's identified by type M9A1 on the on the frame as well. Both of them have the exact same proof testing. Both of them have the exact same Bruton finish. Uh, both of them have the chrome-plated uh, barrels. You did nothing but add to the reliability and, and quality with the M9A1 versus the, the standard M9. I personally like the M9A1 a lot better than the standard M9. I do like the fact that you have the 1913 rail. I do like the checkering a lot better. You know, if I had to create my own ideal M9, it would be an M9A1 with a Brigadier slide on it, uh, which which was a slide that was designed for use with uh, higher, you know, higher pressure ammunition. To me, that would be the ideal M9, would be a combination of a Brigadier slide with uh, this lower. But I think what we're going to do now is we're going to take this to the range and we're going to see how it shoots. With the Brunner M9A1 or the standard M9, insert the magazine below the chamber. By the decocking lever, I drop down, decox it. Now the safety's engaged. I flip up, my first shot is going to be a long drawn double action pull, and then it's, the sequential shots after that's going to be single action. So you can observe and watch the gun. First is a long drawn double action pull. Now you can see we're into the single action, and every round after that will be single action. I can also decock, lift up, now I'm back in double action. Or I can decock, safety on, cock the hammer back manually, and then The M9 pistol is legendary for reliability and durability. Uh, I have to say, in all my years in shooting them, I have never seen one malfunction. Part of having this open injection port prevents any kind of stove pipe malfunctions. You have a very long ejector, which uh, makes the cartridge case clear very well. You have a direct chamber to feed right into the barrel. Another benefit with the M9 pistol is you have a direct magazine to chamber feed. 
Uh, unlike a lot of pistols where you have a ramp that the projectile has to follow the ramp up, this is direct. And that basically eliminates most kinds of feed jams. And because of the open injection port and the longer uh, ejector, it eliminates any kind of stovepipe jams. So for as far as uh, quality or durability or reliability, it's legendary. You know, for as far as longevity, you know, one of the first tests I ever did on a pistol was a 20,500 round endurance test on an M9. And that particular test, I uh, used a lot of ammunition I wasn't supposed to, a lot of plus P plus ammunition. And just around 19,400 something is when the locking block actually failed. Now, I probably knew well into, you know, 12, 14,000, I knew that it was, it was going to fail. I saw that the warning signs you see pitting on the left wing of the locking block, so I would have known to replace it. But since it was a destruction test, I just went ahead and did it. You know, so the reliability of these guns is, uh, is is legendary. I would I would certainly go as far as to say it's probably one of the most reliable handguns ever made. For as far as durable, there are more durable handguns. But for as far as reliability is concerned, I, I have just never seen one of these jam. They don't. They don't. It's just uh, the way that it's engineered. The open slide design aids in that. Some people will claim that the M9 open slide is, it causes it to malfunction because dirt and everything gets into it. That's not the case. Um, all the tests this thing had ever gone through has been uh, it's, it's been incredible. There was not any issues with with reliability. Now we look at today. We look at the uh, adoption of the XM17 or now the M17. I have to say, if I had my choice between the two pistols, I would take this over the M17. Uh, I, I think this is a much better pistol. I think it's more durable. Uh, I think it's more reliable as well. It's battle proven. Uh, the M9, M9 type pistol or the Broad 92 series pistols have served all over the world uh, as primary weapons for military units, uh, standard military pistols, as well as law enforcement all over the world. They're probably is, you know, hard, to, hard to bet. There's too many other pistols that have gone through the durability testing and the wide use of the Broad. It's been out there for quite some time. So, uh, you know, the N9A1 is still available. It's a very small price of $750 on MSRP. I'm sure you get, get it a lot cheaper. You know, the barrel on here is 4.9 inches. This is a full a full size duty pistol. Uh, there's no question that it's uh, it's not a, a compact pistol. There are compact versions of it, but this is a military grade weapon. You know, many people like military grade weapons because if, if uh, it'll go through that kind of a condition, there's nothing possibly that, that would go wrong with it under your conditions, your, your range conditions or whatnot. I've been a long time fan of Beretta. You know, my first pistol I bought was 92 series. The first pistol I used in the military was uh, was the M9 Beretta. Uh, we were one of the first units to, to train with them in, in, in basic training at Fort uh, Fort Benning. Uh, I was informed that uh, right before I got there in 1991, that it wasn't too long before that, that they actually replaced all the 1911s in the armory with uh, the, new, the newer M9s. And I can remember uh, you know, being there, and I can remember hearing the, the instructors talk about how one of the big things that they noticed during the, during the trials or during training was that they had much more people qualify on the first attempt with the M9 than they did in 1911. And they had a significantly more number of people qualify expert with the M9 than they did in the M1911. And a lot of that had to do with the recoil. Um, the more inexperienced shooter, he did much better, or she did much better, with the lower uh, 9mm recoil than they did with the, the 45. You know, the, the width of the grip was always a complaint for people with small hands. Trigger had a long pull on double action. You know, that was a complaint by some people who had very, very small hands. But overall, the 9mm significantly increased the accuracy uh, and the controllability for a new shooter. Now, if you're if you're an experienced shooter, you know the M1911 M9 will make, make a difference. You know, if you're an experienced shooter, I can fire both without without a problem. Obviously, because I have rather large hands, the M9 fits me more like a glove than the M1911 does. But uh, I remember just hearing them talk about the differences uh, between the M9 and M1911 and, and people qualifying, people qualifying expert, people qualifying on the first the first try. But this, uh, this pistol is not outdated. I don't believe it's outdated by a long shot. I think it's going to be in our military for quite some time. We've seen in the military newspapers and publications and websites talking about how the Marines and the Air Force have now adopted the M17, which obviously they, they are, but I still think it's going to be quite some time before you see the M9 completely out of, out of the stock and replaced. Uh, there's been over 500,000, well over 500,000 of these produced for the U.S. government. Brad has gotten several follow-on contracts. Uh, there was a M9A3 that Beretta had um, offered to the U.S. military as a next step up before the M17 program came up, which had most all of the changes that were required. Uh, the Army decided they wanted to go with a brand new project or a brand new pistol, which uh, coming to see how things have, have surfaced, they would have been better off going with that M9A3 program over the XM17 because you didn't have nearly the problems that it was. Plus, having your ability to convert an M9 to an M9A3, pistols that were existingly in stock, departs commonality rather than going to a whole different different system. 
Uh, we do have a video on the N93, so I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.